joining us for the e-learning academy today. Um, today we have David Heinrich and Clark Fogg, and they're going to teach on digital equipment and technologies for photography. Um, you are all muted and we can't see or hear you, so please use the chat feature or the Q&A feature here in Zoom. I'll read the questions to David and Clark at the end of the presentation, so feel free to send them in whenever you get them. And at the end of the presentation, I'm going to launch a poll here in Zoom for you to fill out. It's just eight questions, very, very easy. It'll help us to um, improve our e-learnings for the future. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to David and Clark. Enjoy. Well, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> we thank you so much for joining the ANA Learning Academy. Uh, David and, and myself and uh, usually teach over at the uh, uh, summer seminar at the ANA. Again, um, my name is Clark Fogg. I'm, I'm a retired uh, crime scene investigator with the Beverly Hills Police Department. I did a lot of crime scene investigation and in that I did uh, photography as part of my job duty. So um, I also brought that over to the ANA. I'm a huge time coin collector and, uh, and historian and I've been teaching over at the um, summer seminar since 2003. And uh, David, I'll let you. Well, I, while you were gone, I, I mentioned a little bit, I've been teaching for less time than Clark. And as I mentioned, I, I uh, edit some uh, newsletters. Um, so not much to uh, say again. Okay, great. Thank you, Dave. Well, um, what we'd like to do is kind of let you know, I know that you probably had seen this in the beginning, this course explores the basic and intermediate uh, photography techniques using a proper macro capable camera, iPad or cell phone. Uh, so we uh, teach you how to use those accessories to help you achieve really good numismatic uh, photographs for documenting items in your collection. Uh, understanding the features is a real big, big part of it and, uh, and camera setup and proper lens choice. Uh, so hopefully by the end of the course here, you'll have a better understanding of uh, what your camera is all about and how to take uh, uh, numismatic photographs. It'll be a good starting point. <laughs> yeah. So, and this is what we're trying to achieve here. We, uh, these are the discussion topics. <clears throat> I think you all have probably seen these, um, you know, how you could benefit from attending the ANA summer seminar course, what camera is best for numismatic photography, camera features and settings, how to select a proper stand and designing your workstation, really important. Uh, lighting techniques and understanding white balance, camera accessories for the numismatic photographer, uh, common mistakes and where to find technical help when, uh, um, when you're away from the class. And of course, conclusions and questions. So we hope that uh, uh, you, know, you will get um, a lot out of this. So why should you attend the ANA Summer Seminar? Well, there is a lot of uh, different uh, reasons. Number one, uh, it's great to be with other coin collectors and uh, it's great to share your experiences in your collection and find those people that collect what you collect. It's a time of camaraderie. Um, I've been going to summer seminars since 1997 and I've been enjoying every bit of it. I went as a student, then I went as a, an instructor and I just, it's a great portion of, of my coin collecting that I would not uh, uh, miss. And we hope that you could join us and there are many topics that you could take. The coin collecting um, topic um, in the numismatic photography aspect is one that we will teach you. We all have fun. It's usually about uh, 15 students per class. We provide cameras, we provide copy stands, um, we provide quite a bit of material so you could photograph um, the uh, classroom is set uh, so uh, it helps you learn and have fun at the same time. People come to it in all different experience levels. Some are advanced, some don't even know how to turn the camera on. So um, we, we have a great time. Like I said, you meet uh, people from all over the United States. We talk a little bit about digital in, uh, editing. We talk a lot about different, um, not only coin collecting, but people bring collectibles with them. So, Dave, you want to um, I would just add up? that, uh, you know, what we're doing here today is no substitute for taking the class at summer seminar. Uh, you can't really squish 30 some hours into to one or two. Um, 
but uh, hopefully after today, you'll have the basics uh, to get started. And hopefully, more importantly, you'll come to the summer seminar. As Clark said, it's a great time. Um, meet a lot of people. It's a lot of fun. And uh, Clark, I'll let you go to the next slide. Yeah, that uh, that that is a, a point. You know that uh, even the one week long course at the ANA, um, you, you you still need to work on it. You know uh, uh, thoroughly, um, and not just put it aside and don't look at it until the next summer. <laughs> you know, it's something that you want to uh, keep on uh, developing your skills in that aspect. So what the big question that we always get, what camera is best for numismatic photography? Oh my gosh, this is the best uh, question we get. Um, people come to class with a small camera, as you see there. Um, some come with a uh, digital SLR. We'll, we'll explain what that means. Um, so it, it, it actually has to do with the main question is, what do you want to do with the photos once you take them? Are you writing a book? Do you want to write a book? Do you want to, um, do you want to take great images just to have in your, um, in your uh, uh, library and you want to do a book just for yourself? Uh, are you doing this for a publication like Dave um, does uh, publications? Are you doing this for someone else? So the best thing is, what type of photos are you going to be uh, taking and what are you going to be using them for? And that will help you choose the best camera available. And also a lot of it has to do with pocket uh, book, you know, the, you know, they can get very expensive. So we have to, um, we have to kind of think in that aspect, you may have a camera already, but a lot of these cameras that you see here are not, capable to do a uh, proper close-up photography. So that's something you want to really, really uh, pay attention to. Um, they're great for taking family vacation photos. They're great for taking just general photography. But when it comes to close-up photography, um, it requires a particular type of camera. Dave, do you? Uh, I think you covered it all on that one. Okay. So it, um, it all comes down to uh, the digital SLR camera technology. The biggest difference, um, you know, you hear out there mirrorless technology and regular digital SLR camera technology. You know, uh, the big push is going towards mirrorless. And uh, so um, it, the biggest thing is how the mechanics of, of how the imaging works, uh, DS, LR camera has a mirror in the camera body that reflects images through the lens and the up into the optical viewfinder. When you take a picture, the mirror flips up. And uh, when you take a picture and um, so, and then there's a sensor on the back. And so the image comes in and hits the mirror uh, when you're actually looking to position the coin. And when you're ready to take that picture, the mirror flips up in, um, and it's basically an optical viewfinder that um, that you can look through uh, and you can check your composition and uh, the optical viewfinder on a, D, on a DSLR makes it better for in-studio camera takings such as coin photography. Um, but uh, Dave, do you have any thoughts on that? A DSLR is basically the, the same thing as a, a film camera, um, an SLR, single lens reflex. Yeah. As Clark said, it just means the mirror pops up out of the way to expose the film or the sensor. Um, and, you know, the, the, the mirrorless is just what it says. It goes straight electronically um, to the screen. Right, right. Yeah, there, um, it, it seems like the industry is going more towards that uh, technology, um, the mirrorless technology. The camera is a little smaller the lenses are a little smaller and uh, the um, there's really no need for that mirror to flip up. And when that mirror flips up in that, uh, in that sense, um, what tends to happen, that's the camera sensor right there. So there's no need for that mirror to flip up in when you're taking close up photography uh, images. When that mirror, uh, flips up, it tends to vibrate the camera touch. So you don't get really, uh, 
crisp, crisp uh, photos. Uh, you have to lock that mirror in, into place before you take the photo. So um, that is one uh, aspect if you're taking high magnification photos that you need to watch out for. But in a mirrorless camera, there's no need for a mirror. Uh, it's all it's an optical viewfinder. Uh, instead, the images pass, passes through the lens and directly onto the camera sensor, which relays the image to electronic uh, viewfinder. And the electronic viewfinder allows you to see the image um, basically live view. So you could see it uh, for depth of field, just like the other DSL uh, camera. Um, but um, you, you pretty much are getting a much more uh, accurate picture with the, with the um, mirrorless. It is the future. Yeah, it seems like a lot of the technology, uh, uh, a lot of the companies are going over to the mirrorless. Uh, they are uh, much more expensive than the than the than the typical uh, digital SLR cameras. So you will be paying for that uh, technology until uh, a number of companies start bringing out their their line. It'll start to drop just like the regular uh, digital SLR. When I first joined the department, the first digital camera we bought was like a 1.3 meg camera, and it was $35,000. <laughs> now, uh, you know, these digital cameras are 24 uh, megapixel cameras, and, you know, you could get one, a really nice one for 500 bucks now, even at Costco. So, um, you know, you could see how the technology has, you know, really um, wavered in that. The, the mirrorless is still kind of a young technology. So one thing, and we'll talk about a little later, is that there are not a lot of lenses out there for some of the brands, Nikon in particular. But uh, so that's one thing to kind of watch out for if you don't already own a camera, if you're thinking about buying it, you might want to look into uh, lenses that are available before you buy a particular brand of body. Yeah. And when it comes down to mirrorless too, um, and even the, the regular digital SLR cameras, it's the sensor size. You know, are you doing a full size sensor? A lot of people say, you know what, I'm getting great photos with my digital camera uh, or my, uh, my cell phone. You know, I'm happy with the images. We'll kind of get into that. Um, but as you can see, look at the size of the sensor. Um, the sensor is a very small sensor. Uh, then you jump up to the little, I call them the little handheld cameras. The sensor, uh, again, is very, very small. So there's a lot of digital um, imaging going on uh, to uh, make that photo. And as you can see, it goes all the way up to the higher end cameras, uh, the uh, mirrorless down below, um, which has uh, the sensor right there. It's called the full frame camera. A full frame camera is one that is pretty much mimics uh, 35 millimeter film. So the sensor is approximately the same size as uh, what you would get in a 35 millimeter um, photograph uh, on a film camera. And so technically the bigger sensor, the larger the sensor, the crisper the photo, the, the more you can enlarge the photo. Again, when you were talking about cell, uh, mobile uh, cameras such as iPads, you have um, your cell phones, very small. Uh, they have their place, I, I should say, because sometimes you can't bring your whole setup with you. Uh, but if you are using your, your cell phone, you need to be able to take the best shot you can. And we will teach you that in class also. Uh, we'll kind of go over a little bit of that here too. Any thoughts, Dave? Um, you know, the cell phone can come in handy sometimes, like as you said, if you're somewhere where you can't use your camera or don't have it with you. Uh, an example is I've done this sometimes in a museum and maybe you're, you know, allowed and maybe you're not, but if you hold it sometimes right on the glass of the case to steady it, you can get a better shot, but it's still a small sensor, not as much uh, information, not as many pixels. So you hold it right to the case. I just break the glass. You just break the glass. <laughs> you have uh, to run but yeah, go ahead. <laughs> you have to run faster than me then. 
Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but uh, here we are with uh, uh, these sensors. So we'll kind of pay attention that not all, even the uh, iPads, the sensors on them are pretty small. So the amount of information that's recorded on those sensors is going to uh, reflect on the images that you're going to get also. So just uh, be aware of that. Most of your introductory cameras that you would uh, get for $500 or so are the APC uh, I'm sorry, the APS-C format. Uh, that's kind of your entry level, which is a, a pretty good size sensor also. So they take uh, great shots. A lot of the cameras that, uh, well, in fact, all the cameras that we use in the class are considered the APS-C format uh, size. <clears throat> So these are some very, again, you're, you're asking, uh, so tell me what is a very good camera to, a good entry level camera? And uh, there are two here, a Nikon D3500 is a really good uh, camera. It's 24 megapixel. It has interchangeable lenses. It has a nice viewfinder on the back of a screen. It attaches onto a copy stand very nicely uh, as, does a Canon on the other side there, an EOS Rebel. Both of these kind of cameras you could pick up at Costco, at, at some of the bigger uh, box warehouse type stores. Um, there's nothing wrong with them. A lot of times that they, they will uh, package together uh, lenses. So you might get two lenses. Again, those lenses that they give you uh, are probably not the ideal lens to use in coin photography. They will work, but it's not the ideal lens that uh, you would want for uh, coin photography or any type of close-up photography. So, Dave, your thoughts on that? Um, you know, no matter what system you buy into, um, one of the nice things about the interchangeable lenses is just that. Um, if you decide later on you want to uh, invest in a better body, a uh, higher end body, the lenses will work with that as well. So, you know, you can invest in the glass and, and not worry that you're uh, wasting your money. Um, right. Yeah, these these are uh, approximate cost on these are about five to six hundred dollars uh, for the body. Again, now when you're talking about I know coin people are out there going, I want to spend my money on coins. <laughs> I get that. Um, I do, too. So uh, but also this is um, a form of part of your collection that you could really enjoy your collection a lot more than what you're uh, enjoying it right now. You could look at varieties. Uh, you could record varieties instead of bringing the uh, coin. You could bring the photographs uh, there. It's just a great um, self-confidence in taking a nice uh, photo of your coin and showing that maybe at a coin show uh, or a coin club uh, when they have it. Um, I know Dave has very active in Cincinnati uh, coin cl uh, clubs out there and you have a lot of presentations. So, uh, and that's what we see a lot of. We, we see a lot of really bad photos and uh, there's nothing more aggravating when uh, someone's trying to show you their collection and you can barely see the date, you know, on it. Um, so on, um, on the other uh, end of it are the mirrorless cameras. These are uh, pretty high-end cameras. You may already have one. Uh, they are great. Uh, I think it's the wave of the future where we're going. I think there's still, as you can see, everything from $1,000 all the way up to you know $1,800, and that's just for the body. And then you have to buy the lenses on top of that. So it could get quite uh, pricey up there. Sometimes the, like the Fuji camera comes with, um, some, uh, uh, lenses. Uh, you could buy these on the secondary market. If you, uh, are inclined to do that, I caution you very, um, severely on that just because, uh, you don't know, uh, what the camera has been through. So be careful about buying, you know, cameras on the secondary market. Someone, you know, I'm calling them used cameras, unless you absolutely know, the source that you're buying them from. Um, a lot of times you could get great deals uh, with like the uh, Canon camera here. It's $1,000. Um, when Canon comes out with a newer model, this $1,000 camera will probably drop down to 800. So look for that. You know, you don't need to have uh, uh, the best technology. I have a, a Sony uh, 7, um, 
and uh, it's a mirrorless camera. It's a 61 megapixel camera though, and very expensive body. But again, that's what I do for uh, a living. And, uh, but these are high resolution cameras. They're 26 megapixel cameras, 24. So there's uh, a lot um, out there. Um, you know, it's a decision that you're gonna have to make, you know, as to if the technology is going more towards the mirrorless, which it'll take a number of years before uh, a lot of the cameras out there you're going to see are just going to be all mirrorless, just like the uh, just like the digital uh, cameras today. Um, they, you know, at one point they were film and digital, and then all of a sudden you cannot find a film camera. You would have to go to a, an actual film store, uh, camera store, to actually pick up a a film based camera. So. Um, your thoughts, I would, Dave? I would add to that, um, again, uh, in the example of the Nikon Z6, uh, as recently as this week, I kind of checked to see what lenses are available for that system. Mm. And currently, Nikon does not have a macro lens that they're offering for the Z cameras. They have a couple of them planned with no, as, no uh, release date that I know of. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an, uh, an off-brand uh, macro lens for it, which sounds like the optics are great, but there are some other disadvantages to it. So again, it's something you should not, in my opinion, just jump into, yeah. do some sure. research before, before you pick a system. Yes, that, that's very, very true. In, in picking a brand of camera, Nikon, Olympus, Canon, the other thing that I would actually tell you to think about is uh, I, I kind of, Stick with the name brand if you can. Um, it seems like uh, you could get uh, more lenses um, on the secondary market. I don't have a problem in buying uh, used lenses from reputable companies. I'm talking about uh, camera companies whose business is actually selling used equipment. Um, and we will get into that later in the resource area. Uh, those companies are great. Um, uh, to buy equipment, the typically the the better name camera brands uh, tend to have more equipment out there uh, on the secondary market, so it it allows you to have uh, uh, additional choices instead of uh, some of the um, lesser known brands that uh, tend to. It's it's hard to find lenses in those particular um, company brands. Somebody just sent a message that uh, Nikon's going to release a macro lens for Z system next year. Um, oh, great. So Excellent. Things are changing, but again, uh, just do some research before you invest. Yeah, I, I have used Nikon equipment in the field, um, out in the field. I've used Canon. I've, um, I've used Fuji. I've used, uh, you know, and again, it all has to do with what you are photographing. The Fuji camera was a great camera because I was taking blood images and, uh, and but it also is a great and that was a mirrorless camera then um, I was using Nikon for many 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 years and uh, so I, I, I flip uh, a lot of different brands just to get to know them um, again looking at the different cell phone images this is a typical cell phone this is an image taken at the Carson City Mint uh, it's a die that they have in their museum on the screen it looked great you know until I brought it into <laughs> my computer and then uh, you start to see how it breaks up. It breaks up quite uh, a bit. The date is very fuzzy. The hairlines are all, the fields um, have uh, imperfections um, that you would probably want to, um, to show, especially if you were showing this at a coin club uh, and you had, you want to enlarge your, your coin image on the screen. So um, again, something of this nature here, looks great on your screen until you enlarge it and this is what happens so um, be be uh, aware of your camera's capabilities and check your focus um, go ahead and take that photo and then enlarge it i even do that on my regular cameras after taking a, a photo i will enlarge the image on the viewfinder to see if i have sharp focus So again, with all this information, the big question, what type and brand of camera should I get? <laughs> These are some of the, uh, the best full frame cameras out there uh, on a recent poll 
Uh, th this is not Dave or, or Clark's uh, picks. These are out there in the market. Uh, Canon, Nikon, uh, they, they have different uh, brands here. I would actually um, go out there in, if you have friends that have uh, certain cameras, um, brands of cameras, go ahead and, and ask them if you could, um, you know, be with them and use them, see how it works for, um, for you. The full frames are the same dimensions, like I said, as a frame of 35 millimeter film. The smaller APS sensor format is still the, uh, the standard for entry level SLRs and mirrorless cameras. You don't have to move too much uh, north of $1,000 to go, to go full frame though. Just be aware of that. Uh, you know, it might only be a, a couple of hundred dollars. So um, the real advantages to the format, which features the sensors is roughly twice the surface area of an APS-C format cameras. Um, you, give, you get a lot more control over your depth of field, generally better images uh, in difficult light situations and light really comes into it when you're, uh, when you're talking about uh, cameras. Dave? Uh, I, I want, I'm worried that we're running a little late, so if okay. we just keep it moving. Great. All right, well, so, uh, selecting the correct lenses. Um, this is something after you get your camera body, um, you have uh, uh, macro lenses that you would need to actually um, get to, to, um, to actually have a real um, uh, synopsis with your camera. You have a macro lens of a 60 millimeter and a, uh, and a hundred, depending upon if you're getting a Canon, a Canon is usually a hundred. Uh, Dave is an, a Nikon 105 uh, for a Nikon. Yes. Um, yeah, so the then you have some of these other lenses, the Canon MPE 65 millimeter is really like a microscope uh, lens. So if you're taking microscopic shots, this is a lens that would probably work very well for you but get to know it's about a thousand dollars. These um, other lenses, these macro lenses, one of the reasons why you want to use a macro lens uh, instead of the kind of lens uh, that comes with your camera, the kind of lens that will come with a camera is usually a variable zoom lens. And that's one that shoots wide angle to, um, to a zoomed in particular um, uh, millimeter. So it could be a wide angle, 28 to 70. Uh, whereas these are fixed focus lens. These are, uh, these are lenses designed for macro photography. So this is what you want to look for. And it also depends upon what type of coin you're taking. Um, the 100 millimeter will uh, be further away from your coin. So it'll enable you to have different lighting situations coming into it versus the 60 millimeter, which will be much closer to the, uh, to the item. So um, this is that variable zoom lens that I was talking about. Um, the problem with the variable zoom lens is that the, when you have your camera set up on a copy stand, the gravity will pull the lens towards the item that you're photographing. So the collar on it, this collar here uh, brings you from wide angle to, uh, to a zoomed in capability. When you set it, uh, the gravity will pull it down if the lens is, um, is used uh, quite a bit. Uh, even brand new ones will do that. So you set your whole, you, you set up your whole um, uh, camera shot. And when you're ready to take your photo, when you look in the viewfinder again, or on the monitor, you'll see that the lens has pulled away from the item. So, you know, using a very, also the number, the other nice thing about using fixed focus lenses is that they are sharper than a variable zoom lens. Um, so keep that in mind. People talk about extension tubes quite a bit. And uh, the thing about extension tubes is that it will add distance between the lens and the sensor. So it'll provide magnification. The problem with it is, is that uh, there's a lot of uh, image quality uh, loss in it. So um, just know that uh, they are out there. Uh, they are inexpensive. People use them so they don't have to buy two lenses. Um, I would 
suggest if you want to uh, buy, pick up a pair of uh, extension tubes, they are very inexpensive, $20, $30 or so. And, but the problem, and you'll get to see it uh, and test it out for yourself. Um, there, um, you don't get that much of a magnification gain on it. So uh, the other problem with it is, is a lot of them will not transpose the information like a regular lens. So you have a macro lens attached to your camera. It will, it will feed all the information to the camera versus the extension tube. Some extension tubes does not correlate all that information from the lens to the camera body, which then will uh, take the, the image. Yeah, okay. if you stick with the brand name, like if it's a Canon lens, you get a Canon extension tube, uh, it's much more likely almost, almost certainly that uh, it yeah. will work. And you can see the connection yeah, see, points where Clark's pointing to right now. So if you get, but then there are off brands and they may give you that problem that Clark just mentioned where it won't uh, transfer the information I know we're, the lens to the camera. Yeah, I know we're really going fast with this. Uh, I would suggest you review the video over and over again. And um, we, again, we will provide different types of, um, of um, help for you. Again, um, and where to find things on the camera, they're all different. You know, a lot of students come to our class and they have no idea where to find the information. We will sit down with you. We have three instructors. Uh, Tom Mulvaney is the other instructor. Uh, Dave, myself, we sit down with you guys. We go over all the different functions of the camera. So, um, but I always put it out there and to the students, if it has a button or a dial, it's probably really important. <laughs> and so the camera companies put those buttons uh, and spend extra money putting those buttons on the camera. So most likely it's a very important feature in the camera. <laughs> so if it's there, it's important. Uh, but again, read your book and uh, understand where to find the aperture to the ISO, things of that nature. Yes, yeah, so if you're gonna take the class at summer seminar, um, I'm, I realize there's people watching of all different levels of experience, but if you come to the class, know how your camera works. Yeah. Um, you're at a great advantage if you do, and you're at a disadvantage if you don't. It'll take time during class to figure out where the white balance is, how to work the white balance. So, you know, sometimes we have people come to class with a brand new camera still in the box, and they have no idea how it works. Um, and again, um, if you know ahead of time how the camera body works, where all the functions are, you'll be at a great advantage. Yeah. It's just like a brand new car. If you get a car now that they're all computerized, if you know how the car works in the computer, you'll enjoy it a lot more than <laughs> just, uh, getting in and not knowing. So, um, so the basic camera settings that we typically um, will use on, on it, uh, we're looking at an aperture of f16, f22, f32. I, there is a lot of talk about, oh no, you should just shoot on f8. Uh, you know, it's a center sweet spot of the lens. And um, the reason why you shoot f16, f22, the higher numbers is that you get a better depth of field. Um, and you could experiment with that, shoot a coin, uh, you know, go ahead and image a coin at F16, F22 and F32, and you will see the differences in the shot. Uh, it basically, if you have a high relief metal, you're gonna want to shoot a, at a higher number. So you have to remember the higher the number, the better depth of field you will have. So what I'm saying is that the depth of field is, uh, and we will talk about what depth of field is, it's where the, uh, the, the devices are in focus along with the field of the coin. The shutter speed setting, uh, we usually use aperture priority. So because we want to shoot, uh, because we're setting the aperture, the camera will automatically set the, the speed. So the aperture is basically the opening of the lens going up, opening up and closing. And the shutter is the timer of the camera, how long the shutter remains open. So if you look at it as it's no more than just a, a timer, the ISO setting, we typically go lowest as possible. ISO setting of 100, it's no different than film. We use a, a low number because of, um, of different... Um, 
artifacting that comes on. And what I mean by that is that the ISO setting, if you have it set high, you might get uh, artifacting uh, appearing in your images, fuzziness, you might get uh, pixelation going on. The focus, we take it off of autofocus, we just put it on manual focus. Metering is a real important part. We use spot metering. There's Absolutely. three settings of that. Usually you will have matrix and center weighted, and then you have your spot. We typically go with spot, so it will go to the center of the coin. If you use matrix metering, it might give you the background. So metering is very important. Setting the white balance. Um, you could start off Usually with an important. automatic white balance um, and then go from there. We will talk about that. And exposure compensation. This is a very important part of your, your um, image taking. And you could actually darken your images or make them lighter without adjusting your f-stop up here. So... And where to find all these is a very important uh, fact. The mode dial up here on your camera. Again, I said it's a it's an important feature. If you have a uh, if you have a dial or a button, remember it's somewhat important. You have on here program mode. You have your aperture priority, your shutter priority, and your manual mode. There are four different settings that you could do. Or you could actually do a custom that's a little bit more advanced. I will, uh, again, Dave and myself are just talking about, um, you know, getting you going. And uh, it may appear this way, P, S, shutter priority, aperture priority, and a manual mode. And it depends upon what kind of camera you have. So this could also be found on the viewfinder um, in the screen. So, uh, but... Again, this is what you're looking for, an aperture priority mode. It's an AV for aperture value. It's a setting on the camera that allows the user to set the aperture value. And the aperture is the F number, uh, while the camera is automatically selecting the shutter speed. Because you're, um, the other problem that you have is when if you are shooting in pure manual mode, sometimes just moving your body up to the viewfinder to check the focus changes the value of your lighting. So by keeping it on aperture priority, you're setting the f-stop and you're moving on from there. Dave, thoughts? Uh, you covered it all. <laughs> okay. The metering aspect. Um, this is what we were talking about, matrix metering, center weighted, spot metering. So this is the matrix. It takes, it. some of them, your cameras will take 32 areas in the, um, in the image area, and then it averages them together. The center weighted will be the area in the middle of the viewfinder and the spot is in the middle. Again, the spot metering um, is, the, um, is the way to actually achieve um, a very, very um, you know, accurate um, uh, exposure. So again, spot metering. <clears throat> The f-stop value. We were talking a little bit about that. Um, talking about uh, about definitely um, keeping it to the um, f16, um, f22 area. This is what happens. You have you know your lens opening of 1.4 that allows a lot of light in. And as you can see, if this was your coin here, if the person was the coin, the field, the background tends to be distorted on this type of a setting and F2 and F2.8. Um, the setting of, um, of F16, F22 brings everything in focus. Uh, it's a deeper depth of field. So again, that could be found on the viewfinder, F5.6. It's uh, This is a Nikon. This is where it's on the Nikon the 1.4. So you need to adjust that f-stop immediately uh, upon uh, setting your camera up. Dave? And it's very important. Um, the depth of field in macro photography can be very shallow. Um, for instance, it could be from the, the field to the top of the devices might be the uh, area of depth of field, and that's all you have. So it, it is very important to get the greatest depth of field you can. Um, and so that's why we recommend 
uh, at least the starting point of F-16 or F-22. Yeah, I know this is a lot of information we're throwing at you. So um, this is a, a shot of depth of field where you have a, a number of coins stacked on to one another. The top coin being, you know, again, uh, closer to the lens is going to be sharply in focus. But the last one in the pile may be out of focus because there's not enough, enough depth of field. That's something that may have been taken uh, at an F4. Again, you have coins stacked up. Here you have, you're taking the front of the image and um, the coin stacked on top is out of focus. So that, that kind of shows you the depth of the field is very, very shallow. When you're doing macro photography, the, there's very little depth of field. You have to remember that. It's not like when you're shooting a mountain view, uh, if we're at the a and uh, campus and you're shooting Pikes Peak, and oh my gosh, everything looks beautiful because the depth of field is enormous. So everything looks great. The trees in the front look in focus, the mountain looks in focus, but that re the depth of field reduces quite a bit when you are, um, when you're taking um, close up. This is another example of what the lenses look like. The, um, a lot of people ask, do polarizers work? No, they, they really don't. They don't work in, uh, in numismatic photography. What does help are lens hoods. So these right here, when your camera is set up on the copy stand, this is your lens. And this hood right here aids, and they look all different types depending upon the camera brand that you're buying. But it, it, it gives a better quality photograph by reducing the flare caused by uh, non uh, image forming light. Light will do a lot, you know, light leakage will come in to the, to the camera, skim the lens, and it'll give you flare. So just be aware of that. This is what the lens hood prevents. If the sun is basically your light source, if it was skimming across, it would give you flare. By having the hood, it reduces that, and you're actually just getting the uh, the light from the image coming in. And with that, you know you don't have to buy a lens uh, hood. You could actually download one here at www.lenshoods.co.uk. They have a number of of hoods that you can make out of paper to attach onto your camera. So it's a they're absolutely free. So it's a good resource. But uh, again, this shows you um, what the, the, the hoods accomplish. The other thing that's really important is the shutter release cable. You absolutely need to do some kind of shutter release um, cord, or you could use your, your cell phone to download a program of your camera that you could um, initiate the shutter button. If you try to use the button on the camera, you're going to shake the camera and your images are going to be blurred. So That's you can pick cool. these up. These are uh, different brands. You can get an off brand for like $30. It attaches onto the camera. So when you are ready to take a, a photo, you are not. Clark's locked up. Um, there's also remotes. Um, and a problem with the remotes can be in coin photography since the camera is on a copy stand. Uh, usually the receiver is at the front of the camera. So you have to take the uh, remote and hold it down. So it's just kind of awkward. So a shutter release uh, works much better. Clark, I hope you can hear us. You're froze up. Um, let me see if I can bring the program up guys, and you're going to have to give me a minute, though, to catch up with Clark unless he's back. Oh, there we go. You're back. Go okay, ahead. sorry about that. I don't know what's going on here, but... Okay. Is that, is that good? Okay. Yep. So, um, um, go ahead and, uh, get that lens 
the aperture of f11, f16, f22. Uh, the shutter speed set that at um, at aperture uh, values. Um, the ISO settings, the meter settings, we all went through that. So that's just a checklist for you. How to select a proper copy stand is really important. Uh, this is something a lot of people just don't want to spend money on for some reason. Um, but I'll tell you, it comes in handy when you're taking um, uh, uh, photographs of macro in coin photography or anything. It keeps the camera steady. You could get something of this nature, which is a very small uh, camera. There's no adjustments on it at all. And that's usually um, not a very good camera stand to use, or you could get an advanced camera stand such as this, where you have a release pad, you have good lighting source coming in. A lot of people say, well, I use a tripod. Why not use a tripod? You can, but the problem is you're probably going to um, uh, damage your camera one way or another. They are so unstable. What happens in this situation is that the camera is off balance. Uh, you have this, uh, this uh, center pole that turns into the base your camera is, uh, is uh, one side is heavier. Uh, the camera will tend to, to fall, uh, the 180. You know, the other thing is, well, I'll put something as a counterweight on it. You don't want to do that either. It, it's just not a very good idea. Tripods are used to keep your camera steady when you are in a situation uh, out in the field when you want to steady your camera because your camera um, is shooting at such a low speed and you don't want any kind of camera shake. This is, uh, tripods are designed for studio use when you're taking an image of someone against the background and the camera is upright, not when you were shooting downward. Well, beyond that, there's a great disadvantage in the tripod as opposed to the copy stand. The copy stand, the camera's mounted on, on the column and it's very easy to adjust it up and down. Um, with a tripod, you would be adjusting the legs and, you know, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's not too hard to get a, a, a decent copy stand for probably a couple hundred dollars. Uh, if you check uh, b and uh, they'll have some, maybe Adorama, other places do, Amazon probably. Yeah. You can build your own like the guy did here on the right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, this works. I mean, you know, he... He must, he or she must have a, a coin that they are photographing all the time. But it, as you can see, it's very stable. And he actually has a Mac, a, a micro rail here to adjust the camera up and down. So uh, kudos to the to the guy or or or, or lady uh, that did that. Again, that stand that we saw in the beginning um, is very. There's very little adjustment that could go on. There is very little. Um, uh, depth of, of field between the lens and the base and from the column uh, outward. Not a very good stand to, to have. A lot of shots that we're seeing is people taking it on tripods like this, aiming outward. That's improper for coin photography, unless you're doing some kind of artistic uh, value. Uh, it needs to be on a column that could rise up and down and away from the, the center column. The proper uh, would be to have a nice background. This is a light pad to reduce uh, any kind of um, shadowing that's on the coin. But as you can see, it gives you proper uh, areas to introduce light. You know, a tripod doesn't do that. Tripods have legs and you're gonna have to work around that. Some go outward and the camera, as it goes up the column, it, it uh, moves away from the, uh, the center column itself there. This is a very good type of, of system to have. Um, some of them have a small dial that, uh, that does it in increments. You have some that have col uh, column release pads. Um, so uh, this is a touch pad. Uh, you just touch it and the column will move up and down. This is what we have in the A&A class, right, Dave? Um, yes, it is. 
then the lock mechanism. There are many types. Some, sometimes you can get the lock mechanisms are at a quick release. This pad here stays on your camera and it's a interchangeable, meaning that it could be put onto very quickly onto the copy stand, or it could be put onto a tripod when you're working out in the field. Um, just know that you have to be very, very careful about that because the lock mechanism, that locks it into place and um, that pad is attached to the camera base, this lever releases that pad. So if you don't lock that mechanism, sometimes your you know, cuff of your shirt, you may hit that and the camera may fall off. So be careful about that. There are some that you don't need a base at all. This attaches to a table, but it's good because it's far away from the center column. Uh, you just attach your camera on here. Here's another base. I'm going to just ask what brand copy stand we're using the class. The only reason class, if I remember correctly, the brand was Dotline, D-O-T-L-I-N-E, but I think they've been bought out maybe by Smith Victor. The copy stand is still relatively the same thing. Um, so I would just go on to like B&H's website, check, up their, check out on their copy stands and see, see what they have in that, you know, not so expensive range. You can get really crazy on the cost on some of them. Yeah, I mentioned um, micro rail. This fits. Um, this is a. This particular one is a four-way one. You don't need a four-way. You could just do a two-way. This just um, adjusts your camera very, very minutely for fine focus. You put it. This is the copy stand head. You attach this onto the copy stand head itself, and then the camera attaches onto that. And it acts almost like a microscope where your adjustments, so the camera will move this way and up and down. And it will give you a uh, precise focusing. Again, macro photography, you're talking about very, very minute uh, uh, depth of field and focusing. And so this helps you. 30, about $30, $20, you can pick one of these up. So very inexpensive. This shows going back and forth. There are also things called uh, Quadro Pros. These are fixed focus. They're tabletop models. Uh, these typically are used out in the field, but you might need a scissor jack to um, adjust your uh, coin to go uh, up and down. Or you could get a macro, uh, the micro rail, attach it to it. If this is something, the only thing you have, you know, whatever you have, you could work with it. Uh, you just have to know the ins and outs. Uh, if you want to use your cell phone, they have cell phone uh, adapters. Attach this onto the base and your cell phone or iPad will fit onto that uh, adapter. Um, Dave, anything on that? Uh, just somebody asked if we use bellows. Um, we don't use them in class. I, you know, Clark, you got anything to say on that? Yeah, the bell, the bellows. Uh, again, there isn't any uh, uh, magnification lenses in there. It's just a hollow tube that has a distance between the lens and the camera sensor, and so you may not get sharp photos. Um, they intend to increase, you, they add, you have to add a lot of light to them. Um, so where the lenses, the fixed focus lenses have the elements in there, you could actually shoot at very low light levels. Whereas the bellows, you have to add a lot of light to compensate for that bellow. These are just different types of holders that you could get for your cell phone or iPad. They work great. Uh, um, like I said, if you were out in a coin show and you needed to steady your, your camera, uh, that, that's the key to um, taking great photos is steadying your camera, whether it's a cell phone, whether it's a iPad or whatever. Um, but they sell adapters. These are real cheap, $15, 20 bucks. You could also go into uh, a really good off-brand is Polaroid MP4 copy stands. They don't make... This is designed for old Polaroid film, but it's a very heavy duty copy stand. I've been picking up these um, fairly ch uh, cheaply. I, I bought this one for $38. I mean, uh, I bought it, there's another one for $30. The thing about it is that you would have to adapt it. And the way you adapt it is by removing this whole head, 
you don't need this head. It looks like this when you're done with it. It just pops right out. You, you attach a camera adapter onto it, onto the front. And you put a micro rail onto it and you have a good copy stand for uh, under $100. And uh, the other thing is to actually have a really good work table. Um, be careful about photographing on the second floor. Uh, we had one student who um, was uh, photographing on the second floor and um, they were using the uh, washer and dryer downstairs and it was vibrating against the wall, which vibrated the top floor, which caused all of his photos to be uh, blurred. So <laughs> again, uh, I, um, at work, we had a, uh, an image where when buses would come by, it would shake the street and that would cause image shake. And so you would want a very stable uh, uh, table. This is one at Costco. Uh, it was like $400, but the thing about it, it goes up and down, which is saves you on your back. This is what it looks like when it's down. You could use it as a normal desk. And when you're um, ready to photograph, you just press a button and it raises up. So it'll save your back quite a bit. Uh, the other thing to do is to have um, uh, in, uh, ports for the plugs and um, USB on the side. You want to have enough of those to help you uh, when you're taking images. Dave, uh, anything about tables that you want to get into? Nothing about tables, but someone just uh, put up a message that my sound is still really rough. I apologize if something wrong with my computer. Yeah, yeah, I think we're having internet, uh, quite a bit of internet problems on it. That's why I, I went. Okay, getting back to lighting techniques and understanding white balance. We're going to be talking about three types, axial illumination. I know you've heard a lot about that, where a piece of glass is placed um, at a at a 45 degree angle. It's something that the ANA was using way back when, when they were doing certification, their certification service. Uh, um, was using axial illumination. There's direct lighting, which means that the light source is aimed right at the coin, and there's diffused lighting. There are eight different types of lighting out there. We're going to just talk about three basic ones, um, and that could also go to um, having something very cheaply, like these. Uh, these are known uh, for um, doing craft work, where they have like a magnifier in here, and you can always remove the magnifier and just have a ring light of, of 5,000 K light. Uh, there are some that have your phone that can hold your phone and adjust it, your, your lighting. Uh, these are very cheap. They're 20 bucks out there. You could use something of that nature. You could use a ring light um, system. This is uh, approximately 20 bucks. It attaches to the camera lens and it's a ring light. Um, and it has a uh, rheostat here that you could adjust the intensity of the light around the, uh, the lens. And this is the brand that I have uh, because uh, it, they have some with the rheostat on the, on the actual unit with the on and off. The problem with that is when you adjust the rheostat, you're touching the lens and it may cause camera shake. So anything you could do to minimize camera shake is what you want. Uh, this minimizes camera shake. Um, Dave, do you uh, use ring lights or? I, I use them. I have uh, a couple different ones. I have the, the cheap version, like you mentioned, where you pop the magnifier out. Um, it's fluorescent. It's okay. And I have an LED one. Um, I use them sometimes. Yeah. The, these are the LED panels um, that you could buy uh, inexpensively. We use a lot of these in our class. Uh, you can actually use a light box. These are very expensive. Um, again, they're designed for a particular type of photography. Um, and sometimes you could adjust uh, the left or right um, light coming from underneath. These are very expensive. Again, much more of an advance. They have cheaper ones that um, you could uh, make out of uh, paper or, or, or um or white cardboard. This is axial illumination where the light is coming in, um, striking the glass. The glass uh, uh, panel is set at a 45 degree angle. 
the light comes in and bounces down uh, onto the item and reflects into the lens. So um, they could also have a modified axial lighting um, where you could adjust the, the, um, the 45 degree angle. So instead of it 45, maybe 40 or 35, uh, it's a term, it, it's one of the light sources that you would use for highly reflective coins. It works great with proof coins. Um, like I said, the ANA was using this uh, for many, many years. Every time you got one of the certificates, the old type certificates with the coin image on it, they were using this method to take those images. Dave? I still have them in the museum at the ANA, actually. Yeah, um, they, have a, they do. A, a box built with, with the unit. Uh, yeah, the, the yeah, they, they, yeah, you'll see them out there in coin shows too. Again, um, I, we have some, I just made uh, the 45 out of a plexiglass and the glass panel sits right on the top. The coin sits inside the, the device. The light comes in through this way, strikes the glass. You would put a piece of black on your opposite side to absorb the light. And uh, again, it works great. This is Dave. Dave, I'll let you talk about your outfit here. Well, it's the same thing. It's axial lighting. It's just a desk lamp that you can see with a piece of uh, vellum as a diffuser. Um, and as Clark mentioned, I've got something black on the other side so you don't get any reflection on the glass. Um, in this particular circumstance, and I apologize if the sound is rough, but I also... Uh, I bought a, a small monitor that I hooked to my camera uh, to save my back. Um, you could do uh, use a laptop or whatever, but I chose to buy this little thing here. Uh, it's easy to take around with me, easy to set up, inexpensive, I think $200. Um, and as a bonus, I, I discovered that it uh, as a uh, type of, I guess you call it focus assist, um, Anything that's in sharp focus is outlined in red, um, which you can look on the shield there and you see the red on the shield. Um, that's right. And there's the, uh, we were asking about the copy stand. The ones we have in class are the very same CS920, which I think is a 36 inch uh, mast on it. Somebody asked that earlier. That's a very good point to bring up. Uh, the mask, remember uh, before the mask was not very large on, uh, on the cheaper ones, you need to have your mask on the back here, the rail for the camera to go up and down. Sometimes uh, it requires you to be further up. But as you can see, Dave's camera setup is very nicely put. He, uh, is this your 90 or 105? It's the 105. Yeah. So by having the 105, it has the capability because he's using the 105, his camera doesn't have to be as close to the coin. If he was using the 60, his lens would almost be touching the glass. Touching the glass. Yeah. yeah. So the other uh, thing I'll, I'll mention in this picture, you see the coin, uh, it's raised up above. And I do that on purpose because it puts the background out of focus. So I get a nice, solid background that's just, in this case, black. Uh, and actually that uh, high-tech little stand there <laughs> is the cap off of a magic marker. Yeah. You, you start to use a lot of gizmos and gadgets, uh, you know, to make life a little easier. Um, these are little tricks that, again, this is the black cardboard. So the light comes in and passes, some light passes through and strikes back and, and comes back. The other part um, is, tra is transmitted down to the coin and then goes up into the viewfinder. So Someone now just asked what's a good light source. Um, well, what I'm using here is just a desk lamp with an LED bulb in it. In the past, I've used incandescent. I also sometimes have an LED panel that I use. Uh, in class, right. we have uh, fluorescent photo bulbs that we use. So it, it, it's not... I don't know. They, they all work. They're all good. The important thing is to do a, uh, in my opinion, a custom light balance. Once you mm -hmm. set up your system, whatever the light source is, do a custom light balance. And that's something you need to look up in your manual. Every camera is going to be different. 
how you achieve it. Um, but uh, that's more important than what the source is. Yeah, the light, the lighting. Um, um, here is another um, lighting source. I would have to caution you um, uh, quite a bit in the type of light that you're using with LED. I'll tell you that's been a um, a real lifesaver because of the intensity of the light, the heat of the light. Um, you know, many years ago, I was using photo bulbs, and they would last five hours, and that was it. That's how intense they were. They would give you an extreme headache. With today's technology, with the LED panels, I just bought one, um, a $99 light panel, and I'll show you what that looked like. And uh, it has the intensity of some of these quartz lights. Well, here's another type of axial where the individual is using uh, PVC tubes uh, to achieve. So he basically has um, a... Uh, these are called barn doors and these will direct the light. So he's, the light is coming in and instead of striking the coin, he, the coin is inset into the tube and the light is just hitting the top of the tube, which then uh, increases the contrast of the coin. So the light is coming in, striking the glass, aiming down and going back into the camera. And these are very easily, they're just PVC pipes. And I just went over to, uh, you know, uh, Lowe's or a hardware store, picked up, you know, a coupler for 99 cents to achieve that. Or you could just buy a, a three foot one for five bucks, cut it down yourself to any size you want. Clark, can you jump back one picture or one frame? Yes. You can see there um, the little uh, piece of uh, black construction paper that I'm using to do a similar thing, and that's blocking that light from, you know, coming directly out of the light source and skimming across the coin itself. Um, the light's still hitting the glass and being reflected down on the coin, but it's, it's not going across the top of the coin directly. Yeah. And what will happen is that the contrast of the coin, uh, it, it'll be uh, a lens flare on it. So you have to be, you, you'll know when, um, you have improper lighting. This is called direct um, reflective lighting. So in this situation, um, um, this is a method that Tom Mulvaney uses. Uh, the camera is at a 10 degree angle. The light source is at a 10 degree angle. The angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. This is great for taking proof co uh, toned coins. Again, just a little desk lamp. This is what we use, right, Dave, uh, at, the, yep. at the course. They're just a bunch of uh, little desk lamps. It's coming, striking the coin and going back into the lens. So um, this is, like I said, it works out great. We also teach you, um, there's another method that we uh, uh, teach you and that's uh, timed exposure where we could take uh, one individual had an opal and she wanted all the ref reflectability to be in the image because when she had the image of um, the, uh, the one light coming down, she would only get one color. So we taught her how to basically take a timed exposure where you take the LED and rotate it around really quickly. And that works great with tone coins. You get all the, all the colors of a tone coin in one image without doing any kind of, um, without any kind of uh, editing. This is domed transmitted lighting. This is, uh, I know everybody has seen these out there in the coin um, shows where um, you place your coin inside the dome and uh, you apply light on the outside and it will um, transmit the light and bounce off the, the dome and uh, it helps take really even lighting, especially if you have collectibles, 3D collectibles. Uh, a lot of people, we have a dome in class that we you could experiment with. Um, you don't really need them, but if you really want to get into it, you could do it very cheaply. You could go over to, I went to Ikea and bought this uh, lamp for 20 bucks and um, um, I took the lampshade off and that's what I used as the transmitted. Um, you could actually get a little lampshade from a nightstand and Remember, it has a hole on the top and a hole at the bottom, so the lens goes right through <laughs> and images. This is another little light 
uh, that you could use. So you're, you're, you just have to use your imagination as to, um, as to um, kind of using, uh, diffusing your light to take an even photo. Dave, do you have any thoughts on that? No. Um, this is, uh, uh, what is white balance? So we'll, we'll get into, in digital camera, white balance is what makes the, the image look white. With digital cameras, uh, you can either do it with an auto, but um, there are uh, different types of, Dave was talking about doing a custom white balance. Um, just know that the cameras, the light temperatures out there are of all different size Kelvin. You have incandescent bulbs. So this is what your, um, your camera LED will show on the back of your camera. Um, you can have an auto, which means a camera will automatically adjust your, your white balance. You could adjust it if you're using regular light bulbs, incandescent, fluorescent, direct sunlight, flash. If you're shooting in a cloudy or shady uh, environment, um, these all um, you know have to do with the color temperature. Some of them you can actually, if you're using 5,000 K lights, you can actually uh, dial them in and set it for 5,000 K. So uh, just know that your camera has the ability to actually dial in a specific Kelvin temperature, uh, leaving the white balance on auto uh, will produce satisfactory images, but you should go one further. This is why you have a camera that has the capability of it making all these adjustments. Again, the, the custom white balance um, tunes it in more than, than uh, just trying to match, you know, whatever, tungsten to a tungsten bulb. If you do a custom balance, it's exactly your situation, your current lighting situation. The bulb may be old and it's not as hot as it was when it was new. or So uh, I, I think there's no substitute for doing a custom white balance. That's a very good point. Yeah. Uh, understanding Kelvin, the light temperatures. Uh, Dave was talking about when he woke up, it was pretty, uh, you know, uh, cool. And the day is getting hotter over there in Cincinnati. Um, yes, you know, here in Beverly Hills, it's the same thing. You know, it's getting really hot and the daylight uh, is at different uh, temperatures. Pe some people like photographing near a window. Um, we warn against that just because uh, you are introducing too many different types of lighting coming in. So um, this kind of tells you the, the different uh, color temperatures here. Um, candlelight being 1,000 Kelvin all the way up to a really um, heavy daylight, which is 10,000 Kelvin. It's just a unit of measurement, um, and it describes the hue of color, as it says here, and it does, and don't confuse it with the temperature measurement. Um, the higher the Kelvin, the whiter the light. Again, this is on the back of your um, of your um, screen. Sometimes it'll actually show you daylight. They're measuring at 52. The shade is 7,000. Tungsten's 32. That's the approximate Kelvin. Um, we have a resource for you. Um, you could click on this um, or uh, plug that into your um, web browser and it'll explain what balance, what white balance is. And that'll give you a better understanding uh, on how to set it. And your pictures will, will be much more uh, vibrant, um, such as the coin behind me. Uh, setting the, the different white balance is really important with tone coins because it'll give you all the different colors that are appearing. Using gray cards, um, Dave, I'll let you cover that. Well, you can use a gray card for, for white balance. Most people just use a, a white sheet of paper or cardboard. And again, I'm talking about doing a custom white balance where you actually set up your, your uh, scenario, your lighting situation, and do the custom white balance. You hold or lay the piece of white paper or 18% gray card down and uh, make the custom balance. You can also use it as a, as a background uh, for photographing. You can lay your coin on that. Um, it, it's, a, it's a nice uh, moderate color. Yeah, it'll help you too. Good point, Dave. Uh, um, 
um, it can also help you very well in uh, editing your coin. Yes. Um, when you bring your coin into an editing program, it'll help you uh, with that. We give you another um, information. Go ahead and plug that into uh, your web browser and how to use a great card uh, for custom white balancing uh, will help you. Um, again, different lighting situations, um, which is the better light source. Um, it's all gonna be, you know, incandescent light bulbs are very hot uh, to use them. Plus they're getting harder to find out there. If you do use these, I usually take a little steel wool and take off the little black information on here. If you're photographing coins uh, proof, you may end up getting some of that black lettering in your coins. So be careful about that. This is an LED bulb, fluorescent bulb. Um, we typically use the, um, the multi LED panel here uh, in our class and these desk lamps. Um, these LED, again, these have barn doors on them to adjust your lighting. They're very lightweight and uh, they're easy to handhold and they're very cool to work with, so. I, I would add at this point, I pretty much would not recommend the incandescent just because of the heat. Yep. It's, it's uh, a lot more pleasant to work with the LED fluorescent, um, you know, especially if you're attaching, uh, you know, some type of uh, vellum or something uh, to to the the lamp as a diffuser, um, or moving the lamp around, they get hot if you use the incandescent. So I would right. suggest LED or fluorescent. Yeah, especially the if these are metal here. Oh my gosh, they get very very hot. So yeah. be careful. And it doesn't that. matter what the brand of desk lamp is; just whatever cheap one you can find at Staples or wherever. Right. This is one that I picked up uh, for a hundred bucks. It, it has, um, I think, 530 LED lights, battery operated. You could plug it in. It has the barn doors. As you can see, it's very lightweight. It's about five by seven, very lightweight uh, light to use to hand hold if you needed to. Um, um, so it's very, very easy to use. If you don't have barn doors, you could pick them up for, again, 20 bucks. You could put this one, this style on your desk lamp or put this style on your, um, on your um, LED panel. It's a very, um, I'll let you talk about bubbles, Dave. <laughs> for bubbles. Uh, leveling your camera. So you want to, you know, I always say this in class, you want to get the camera level, but really what you want to achieve is you want the the lens, the face of the lens, and or the more importantly, the, the, the sensor plane to be parallel to the base of the copy stand. Um, make a long story short, as long as your copy stand is, is level at the bottom and then you level up the camera, you, you should achieve that. Um, and you can see there's a little, uh, like the one that just popped up, it's a, a three-way. You can get them for uh, usually five bucks or so, um, watch for sales on them. Um, it slips into your hot shoe on your camera. It makes it really easy. The one at the top left, it's just a bubble. That would work fine if you're doing like landscape photography or something, but it would be totally useless in a copy stand. Yeah. And... Uh, just be aware that sometimes when you buy these uh, three-way or two-way bubble, they will include uh, some of these. Uh, I know people will tend to put these on their camera because they're really low profile. But again, as Dave mentioned, it doesn't work. <laughs> it's just uh, um, they're, they're even difficult to see when you're using them on a, a tripod. Uh, just stick with the three little three level um, and that keeps your camera um, very well. Um, um, level. This is uh, Dave's setup, um, again, um, using an external monitor to actually uh, save his back. You could, you, you could actually plug your computer, your laptop, or your, your desktop in camera and do everything from your computer. You know, so you don't have to look uh, through the viewfinder at all. 
Uh, we use this setup, uh, you know, at, uh, I used to use it at work in this situation. I use it at home uh, here in, uh, when I take images. Very, uh, uh, it gives you an accurate depiction of what you're going to be seeing in your editing program. So it allows you to, one of the other reasons why, uh, let me get back to uh, when Dave was saying leveling your camera off. Um, some people like shooting at a 10 degree angle because of the light. But again, you're going to have to correct that in your editing program because your coins will look um, like an elongated coin. So you have to fix that elongatedness in your digital imaging program. And it, it's just one less step you need to do if you shoot um, your, your parallel to the, to the coin uh, level, uh, your image will be round, your coin will be round. Um, uh, per se, and you will not have to correct that in an imaging program. Dave has a great image here. Uh, the background is highly contrasted from the coin, so it'll be easily uh, adaptable in the editing program. Yeah, and, and, and this image here it looks gray, but the actual image, that background is nice, solid black. So if you wanted a, a black background, which I use a lot, um, there's, there's nothing you have to do in editing to uh, achieve it. If um, you could pick up these, you've seen these at coin shows, they attach to the computer. Uh, they're little um, microscope type uh, cameras. Um, um, they, they, they serve their purpose. Just know that uh, they could be difficult to use. Um, and again, this is something improper. You're not going to clip, you know, uh, hold down your, your bill like that, uh, it's going to cause uh, possible damage to your, your currency. So this is where taking images properly on a copy stand will help you. You could, you could achieve this image with your camera without this device is basically what I'm trying to say. Um, you may want to actually have uh, rulers that you have next to your coin because you know what the size is, but the person um, who you're showing the coin to doesn't know the size. So in order to establish a uh, proper um, size of the coin, uh, you could do it with millimeter or you could have, I use this ruler down below, which gives me grayscale, uh, the black levels. And it also, when I'm photographing um, tone coins, it gives me uh, the color spectrum here. And so uh, basically in my editing program, I know this is black, this is gray, and it helps me adjust the color. Um, again, this particular one adjusts white, gray, and black levels. So all I have to do is click on the black, it gives me my black levels, click on the gray, it gives me my gray, click on the white, gives me proper um, white values. They're very inexpensive. Um, Arrowhead Forensics is where I pick up my rulers. Um, uh, they have a photographic section there. So um, something that I used at work quite a bit, but it also helps in coinage. Dave? Um, if you attend the class, Clark will give you one of those. <laughs> <laughs> it'll it'll be worth the trip to Colorado. <laughs> Just for that ruler. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And a cup of coffee. <laughs> yes. Um, all righty. Um, plastic polish. Uh, very, very important to have. Um, a lot of people don't want to. They have rattlers that they don't want to re um, uh, get them redone. Uh, this is one that I actually bought. And it was a shame that the back would look like someone took acetone to it. Um, but um, this is good. Even if you have coins that are not as scratched up, when you start to do microscopic photography or even just imaging, uh, you could adjust your lights or you can actually just take uh, number two and polish in the direction of the, of the scratches. And this is what uh, that image ended up uh, looking like after I polished it. It just um, helps you get a, a, a good image uh, without um, having to do a lot of work in uh, an image program. Again, you could pick these up on, gosh, eBay. You could go to Amazon. You could get them at the coin shows. So, um, Laboratory scissor jack. Uh, they use these in laboratories quite a bit. They work great in coin photography. I usually put a piece of foam on the top and I put the coin on top of the foam and I could adjust, bring the coin up to the lens instead of me adjusting the camera to the, um, 
the lens uh, to the coin. So they're called uh, rack scissors, aluminum lab lifting stands. <laughs> they're called all different types of things, but uh, uh, it helps quite a bit. The other uh, little secret about um, using a flashlight reflector, um, you, this is getting actually difficult to, to find. You could actually get old uh, flashlights that have the reflector and um, we, you could place the coin within the reflector. This is an actual um, projector reflector. It's glass on the inside. You place the coin inside the bowl and you, it will reflect the edge of the coin. So on this, um, on this particular coin, it actually shows uh, the front of the, co uh, the uh, obverse of the coin, and then you have the edge writing. The only thing you're gonna need to do is in your editing program, you're going to have to flip the image because in the mirror it's backwards and then you're in your imaging program you could flip it so you can actually read this helps quite a bit when you're actually counting the different readings on the coin to to authenticate a coin so th this particular one this pair they call them uh i used a 68 millimeter round concave parabolic cost about 19 dollars um not not very expensive like i said you could use a, a flashlight reflector, but with LED, they're attached onto the reflectors. Now it's quite difficult to find. You, know, you got to find the old, the old cheap uh, incandescent flashlights. You know, so you see them at a yard sale, or if you got one laying around the house, or if you're lucky enough to find them somewhere still, you know, pick up a few of them and take the reflector out and throw the rest away. <laughs> yeah. The other um, aspect, close-up lens attachments. We use these in the class. Um, uh, Tom Mulvaney, uh, if I may, he loves these. I, he showed these to me and, and I thought they were, uh, man, I, I use these at work all the time for uh, doing investigation um, in photographing bullets to, to pills and whatever. Uh, it's just a three, um, it's a 6X, 12X, 24X lens that attaches onto a holder, which then the holder attaches on the front of the lens, makes your camera into a, a very super macro uh, lens. You could get them, you know, I, I mean, they even have them on eBay and Amazon. They don't produce them anymore, but you could get them on the secondary market uh, uh, rather inexpensively. But instead of buying a huge um, lens, uh, these are a great, um, great addition to your, to your uh, toolbox. There's also some that that uh, will screw on just like a just like a filter, exactly. Um, and they make them in different diameters depending on your lens size. Yeah, I and thanks for bringing that up. I would not attach um, if you buy a lens. A lot of people want you to use the UV filter to protect the lens. Uh, in close-up photography, I take those off because Absolutely. that's one less. Uh, a um, lens that needs to uh, be attached to the camera, which then reduces the clarity of your image. So I would take off the UV filters, any of the protective filters off of your, your lens before you start taking uh, photographs. That's something that's great if you're out in the field, um, you're, you're you know, at a day at Disneyland or wherever on vacation, and you're using that to protect your lens from you know, someone hitting your camera lens and damaging the, the actual uh, glass on the front of it. Um, light panels are great. I use a little five by seven light panel. When you put a coin, especially ancients, you uh, tend to, in the different lighting situations, uh, you'll get a shadow effect by turning the um, the uh, light box on. It will eliminate that shadowing, and it will give you a nice crisp uh, edge. That helps with um, collectibles too. So you have a little uh, shadowing going on here by clicking on it uh, in the editing program. It'll help you, and and just know that too. Not all times do you are you're gonna. Are you going to be taking a photo like you are looking at the coin? Sometimes you may have to rotate the coin, or sometimes the coin may need to be in this corner of your viewfinder because of the lighting situation. The coin doesn't always have to be in the center of the viewfinder. 
It could be offset. It could be rotated. Uh, you could always rotate it back in your editing program. But it, it, it helps, again, one less step to eliminate the shadow in your program and creates a nice white background. See those shadows? Um, they have um, macro attachments for your uh, cell phones. I know you. a lot of people have seen um, these uh, that attach to the, um, the lens of your, uh, of your cell phone. These are great for out in the field when you're at a coin show. Uh, again, uh, due to high magnification, the, end, the images tend to blur because you're pressing the, um, the shutter release on the phone. Uh, the images tend to be highly pixated and uh, the lighting issues, the, the distance from the, um, from the actual um, uh, camera lens to the coin is very, very small. So sometimes this uh, lens is actually touching the coin, which is improper. So be careful about that. But, you know, this is, you know, a 21X macro lens. So it turns your cell phone or tablet into, a, um, an, you know, it may give you some uh, good magnification photos. A little tip for cell phone use is if you're, if you're able, if, if you're out somewhere, you find something, you want to take a picture of a coin. If there's something around like the size of a coffee cup, you can lay your cell phone on top of it with the, the lens protruding over the edge and uh, set the timer so you're not shaking the phone. Right. Um, it'll, it'll help you get a better image with your cell phone. Yeah, that, um, yeah, doing the, uh, again, play, uh, the key to it is stabilizing your cell phone, stabilizing your iPad, stabilizing uh, uh, the camera shake, anything you can, because again, this is what you end up getting. Uh, looked great in the viewfinder or uh, when you're reviewing it, but when you start uh, enlarging it, it breaks up quite a bit. And especially, like I said, when you're trying to do it um, through, um, when you're trying to show this at a coin uh, show or making a presentation, or when you're actually enlarging the image for a book. Um, we, uh, I always tell everybody, um, take your images of your coins like you're going to be publishing a book because you can never go back and retake them. Uh, it would be terrible to take your photos. And I know that you had um, the e-learning had a whole thing on digital imaging. That was a great. I, I ask you to review that again. But, um, you know, take the images like you are going to be doing a book because you can never go back. And when you really want the images, you'll kick yourself. Um, we use a lot of poster putty that comes in handy. Um, these, uh, what is poster putty? It's basically, you know, uh, mounting um, adhesive. You could uh, ball it up. And sometimes when you have, um, you know, uh, errors of this nature and you're trying to photograph uh, a certain area, uh, it'll help you stabilize your coin. It also, you could ball up a piece. And if you have a coin that is um, tilted in the slab, you could level it off by placing a ball of putty under the slab to level off your coin. Because again, the depth of field is, you're, you're fooling around with depth of field. This part will be in focus. This part will be out of focus. So by putting the little ball of, of putty under here, it creates a level field. No pun intended. <laughs> so. So we're, we're coming up to the, the la, uh, last sections. So um, these are some of the problems that people have, slightly blur blurred images. You know, they always say, you know, hey, what's going on? And I'll just say, you know what? It might be the camera shake due to the shutter release cable button used um, instead of a shutter release cord. Uh, or the image is not sharp, the mirror lockup um, system. Uh, again, you're taking a macro image and you're viewing the image th through your camera which is going through the lens into and hitting the mirror and when you're ready to hit the shutter the mirror goes upwards and when it goes upwards it uh it creates camera shake so there is some cameras have mirror lockup a mirror lockup feature so when you're done adjusting your camera for everything 
go ahead and lock up the mirror, wait a few seconds, then take the photo. Uh, exposure has a rainbow appearance. It might be light contamination. When you were setting up your studio uh, where you're photographing, uh, we ask you to, when we do it in class, all the lights go off, just like a grading room. Uh, when you send your coins into PCGS, NGC, all the grading services out there, they're usually grading their coins in a dark environment and there's only one light source coming in. So you have, uh, they usually use, I think a 60 to 70 incandescent light bulb um, and the windows are shut. Uh, there isn't any overhead lighting going on. So be careful, light contamination is a real big issue. If you are shooting near a window, you have light coming in through the window. If you have a uh, fluorescent light going on in your room, you have that, and then you're introducing a 5,000 K light, you have all this light contamination and it may have a rainbow appearance on your coin. Dave, do you? Um, yeah, I just, again, uh, it makes me think of custom white balance. Yeah. Um, reduce all those extra sources of light and do a custom white balance to match whatever situation you have. Because the main thing you want to avoid is um, camera vibration. <laughs> so, um, you know, really keep that in mind when you're um, dealing with the problems. Um, where to find technical help? Um, there's a great book out there by um, Mark. We use it. Mark Goodman has the book. It looks like, uh, like this. I don't know if you can see. Uh, but uh, it, it's um, Numismatic Photography. Um, the number one thing would be coming to the ANA summer seminar and just talking to people. We have people who are professional photographers that take the class. We have people, um, who don't know how to turn their camera on. We love everybody to come and everybody has a good time to just know, um, that they're all there with one intention and that's to take great coin photos. Um, everybody brings different types of coins from small gold, uh, California gold to large metals. So um, we have a great, uh, great time. Um, dpreview.com is a great place to review digital equipment. You can get on different sites. Nikon has a site. Canon has a site. I'm sure, you know, Fuji has a site. They're all different sites. Uh, the camera manufacturers have tutorials that you could go to and learn about it. Uh, the Tabletop Studio has a great uh, resource for um, white balancing and for exposure index um, compensation. You can get on YouTube. They have great um, YouTubes about coin photography. Uh, what you're doing here, taking this um, little uh, two-hour uh, course with us, just to give you things to think about. The Lens Hood, um, download a free Lens Hood. Uh, bnhphotoandvideo.com has... Uh, you know, how to buy a digital camera, what, what type of cameras are good out there. Imaging resource is another good uh, resource itself. M maybe Dave, you could share. I don't have any more resources than what you have up there. Um, yeah. Again, uh, the number one thing would, if for coin photography, if you can come take the class, there's no substitute for uh, hands-on, you know, day after day using the copy stand, experimenting with lighting, using different camera lenses and bodies and different types of lighting, seeing what other people are doing. Um, yeah, that's, that's the best part is uh, other people have tips of the trade that we don't know about. We, we learn uh, as an instructor, I get so much out of it because um, not only do I teach the course with Dave and Tom, but I also learn from the students, which makes it even uh, much more um of a valuable. And then when all that happens, you do the numismatic photo dance because you're happy that their images came out great. So <laughs> uh, I hope that you will be doing the dance once you're all uh, done with it. So with that, um, we have some questions and answers, I'm sure. I don't know if we have time for that or, or what, but. Um... So um, I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll if you guys could all um fill that out before logging off. And then David, would you mind reading the questions? Because I'm not sure which ones you answered yet. Um, can I see them? Yeah, so at the bottom it says Q&A. Bottom of your screen. 
If not, I can go ahead and, and read Yeah, it. well, there's... Um, There's so many questions here. Um, well, one, one is he's interested in a difference between setting up taking photos of raw coins versus slabbed coins. Well, um, it's, it's, I guess I would say easier just to uh, photograph slabbed coins the, the problem with slabs is reflection off the plastic. Um, sometimes it can make you pull your hair out. Um, and well, there's other problems too. As Clark mentioned earlier, if the coin is tilted in the slab um, or if it's too deep, uh, the, the um, you know, it's hard to get the lighting in there correctly and not get a shadow from the edge. Um, Clark, you got anything to add to that? Um, you could actually make, um, at times, uh, I will make a template and I will have a piece of white paper and cut out a circle. So the only thing that's showing is the coin itself. And I place that white sheet right over the uh, coin slab. So the only thing that's showing is just the touch of the plastic and just the coin. And that will eliminate any kind of uh, shadowing going on. So I take one image of the label and the whole slab, and then one of the coin in the holder. And that tends to help. Uh, the other thing too, is sometimes I will take a piece of paper, just plain paper, cut out a hole uh, for the lens and place that because uh, your camera may be um, reflecting in the plastic slab itself. And so just be aware if you get like darkness on a slab or a coin, it may be your camera reflection. You're uh, too close to your, your, your item, your coin, or your slab. So that will help um, in isolating just the coin itself. Um, I'm just picking questions at random. Someone asked about, uh, they have several EF lenses for their full frame Canon. Will these work with a mirrorless Canon? Um, I, I'm not sure. I think there are sometimes adapters to uh, take your um, your uh, older lenses and use them on the mirrorless. Um, there might be some limitations to that. Um, you know, uh, yeah. there are definitely different lens systems for the, for the uh, mirrorless. Right. Um, any I think there, there are adapters for that the Canon is doing. Right. Well, they, but he's asking, well, yeah, there are adapters. Um, Let's see, what's another question here? Um, uh, same thing, will Nikon DSLR D70 lenses fill Nikon mirrorless body? I think he meant fit. Oh. Uh, same thing, there may be adapters. Um, let's see. Here's somebody asking about uh, the megapixels and resolution. Current current line is 26 megapixel or more, but earlier versions of cameras were using 10 megapixel plus or minus. Is a Canon 50D with 12 megapixel versus a 90D with 26 or more? Um, you're the Canon guy, Clark. Yeah, the the megapixels that are out there, um, they again they're getting uh, higher and higher. Um, they were pretty much it was uh, standstill around ten to twelve, and then all of a sudden it went to um, the eighteen to twenty four, and it's hovering around the twenty four megapixel uh, aspect um, of it, and. Uh, it's a very complicated formula of, of megapixels versus uh, the, the quality. But uh, again, I tend to um, get away from um, lower megapixel cameras because the sensor will be recording more information um, uh, with one that has uh, a higher megapixel rating on the camera. So, 
you're, you're going to be fine if you're in the 24. Mostly the cameras out there are in the 24 megapixel anyway. So it has to do with uh -huh. also how large you, you are going to enlarge the image. But, um, you know, we could, I, it, it, we could go on for a number of hours regarding that. Someone asked, uh, can you use a two second timer instead of a shutter release? Absolutely, you can, uh, but you'll find, depending on your camera, that you might get tired of setting the, uh, the timer every, every shot. Um, and uh, you might wind up uh, going and picking up an inexpensive uh, shutter release. Yeah. I would recommend it. I used to use the timer. Yeah, it's uh, almost like putting your coin on a scanner. I mean, why do that? I mean, you're you're possibly touching um, the lid with your coin. Uh, it takes so long for the scanner to scan. Uh, it's the same thing. Letting your camera stabilize uh, is the key. And if you have a timer on your camera, you're going to get aggravated after a while because you're going to be spending more time waiting than taking photos. So. Uh, somebody asked, is light, uh, light source color temperature important? Um, again, that goes back to the custom white balance. Um, I, I, that's the most important thing. Yeah. Um, you can pick up daylight bulbs at Lowe's equal to Kelvin daylight. That's, yep, you can. Uh, but again, I would do a, a a, a white balance, a custom white balance, no matter what source of lighting I was using. Uh, somebody asked, what's the best, what was the method for shooting um, proof coins and uh, somebody asked something else. Oh, uh, the best uh, to uh, get the most accurate colors on a tone coin. I think um, kind of answer both those both those questions with the same answer that uh, axial lighting might be a, a good way to do both of those. There, there are some people that are firm believers in the once you use the axial lighting. Um, and using modified versions of it, uh, people tend to shoot all their coins with axial lighting. Um, I know a, a number of people out there that that's all they use. And uh, others will use direct lighting, um, the 10 degree method um, on tone coins. So um, it's actually perfecting your method. And um, that's what we kind of work on in the class. We have different uh, stations set up and you move from station to station taking photos or you're with a partner that is um, photographing different types of coins. So we, we, we photograph copper and we photograph silver, we photograph metals, we photograph whatever. And uh, we, we take you through the different, okay, shoot it with axial lighting. Okay, shoot it with direct lighting. Okay, shoot it with diffuse lighting and then um, you will you will start to see what is easier for you uh, once you get home. I see a number of questions about uh, best best place to buy uh, all the stuff you need for setup. Best place to buy a system with lens. Um, you know, personally, I like B and H Photo. Um, they have pretty much everything that pertains to photography and they have other electronics as well, but um, there's other sources like Adorama and there's, you know, I guess Amazon, but uh, the nice thing about B&H, um, if you're not sure, you can, if you want, you can live chat or you can call up and speak to someone in a certain department of, about what you're looking for. So. Yeah, I tend to, I tend to use Best Buy a lot because they have a reward program. You can buy more equipment <laughs> with your reward uh, points. I'm not pushing Best Buy at all. I don't, I, I'm not an employee or anything. I just use them. Um, uh, they're easier to ask questions. Sometimes you could bring your camera to Best Buy and attach the lenses 
right onto your camera and see how they work with your camera, um, which is a great feature, um, you know, so. Um, someone asked what, what editing program would you recommend? Um, Photoshop, although Photoshop is, has gotten pretty expensive. Um, you can use Elements, which is a, uh, you know, one-time purchase, about $100. Uh, Clark's been using that lately, I know. And there's a number of people talking about the sound on my mic. There's something, I guess, wrong with mine. I, I apologize for it. So I'll, I'll let Clark talk about the editing software. Um, I've been using Adobe Photoshop since it was, uh, I think, a 2.0. <laughs> so um, I, that's something I used at work, and uh, we have went all the way through. The last version I used was uh, CS6 before it went to a subscription version. When it went to a subscription, I didn't like having a subscription. Uh, so um, uh, I do have a version of CS6 uh, on my computer and also elements. And I've been finding the problem with um, CS6 is it's very expensive. Uh, I've had tremendous luck with the elements. And uh, I think now it's like $50 or $60 for elements. It does everything you need to do coin photography with. The ANA has purchased computers, laptop computers for us in class. Uh, on the, those computers is, um, is uh, elements. And we kind of walk you through the basic um, uh, editing features uh, that you would need for coins. So I, I, I'm happy with Elements. I mean, it's a cheap program. The number one reason why I like Photoshop itself is because there's a lot of help out there. You can get on YouTube uh, and some of the, the web programs and ask about Photoshop help. And it, it brings you, there are so much information versus other programs. Uh, that are proprietary to certain computers uh, that you buy, uh, the help out there is very slim. So I would, uh, I typically stick with Adobe Photoshop because I could find help out there, but um, Elements does everything that I need. So I'm, I'm happy with it. And Quick one, somebody wants to know, what's the expected life of a digital sensor? Their, their DSL camera has an exposure count. I don't know, is it 100,000? <clears throat> I, I don't know. You know, you have to remember um, it's a computer. <clears throat> so, um, you know, when I was shooting way back when, when I first started, I mean, I, I was on the department 37 years. Uh, when I first joined, we were using film. <laughs> so, um, you know, we barely sent the cameras out for repair. And I mean, it would be something if we sent it out every 10 years. Now with digital cameras, it seems like... Um, um, if you drop them, um, that's why we want you to use a really heavy duty copy stand and not a tripod. So you don't drop your cameras. As soon as you drop them, th there's a lot of damage that could happen. Moisture is another terrible thing that enters the camera. Um, you could actually get on the websites of some of the camera manufacturers and they will give you, um, an expect uh, expectation of the life of the camera. So um, I typically have my cameras for um, maybe, um, I know at work we were going through digital cameras um, every two years, we would switch them out uh, just because of different issues. But again, we're using them every day, crime scene after crime scene. Um, so um, they were, they were um, developing, you know, certain problems. Uh, the other thing that you have to be careful about in that is these little uh, compact flash cards. Um, some cameras take the compact flash cards, others take the SD cards. I prefer the SD cards rather than the compact because the uh, compact flash card has uh, minute pins that this card fits into. And we at work have had several people insert the card um, tilted and it bent a pin. And when you bend a pin in the car, uh, in the camera, uh, it's gonna be rather expensive to repair. So um, stick with an SD card if you can. So it, it, again, to the question, it's a, a lot of different variables. Um, you know, if you, 
use your camera, um, you know, on vacation in a dusty area or, or whatever. Um, but typically, uh, they have a pretty good lifespan. The thoughts on using a focusing rail on a tripod. Um, you know, um, it's better than using a tripod without a focusing rail. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, good. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you could. Yeah. I mean, you, um, you can use a very good question. Um, you could use a focusing rail on a tripod, but again, you're dealing with the tiltingness um, of it. Uh, the focusing rail on a tripod is good when you're in the field and you're trying to um, do fine focusing in a linear way. Um, again, when you tilt the camera um, in a, um, we've had a number, we use tripods when we're shooting shoe impression evidence at a crime scene. And I can't tell you how many times the camera tilted. Uh, you would have to really stabilize the camera in that fashion. And if we're having problems out in the field, I can imagine uh, what kind of problems uh, occur out there uh, in a controlled environment, such as a photo studio. I am not. Uh, I'm not a. Um, I'm not in favor of using cop, uh, tripods at all uh, when you're doing coin photography. Rihanna, a couple of people have asked about um, when or how this will be available. This in the future. Can you? Yeah, so we are recording this and we'll put it on our website within the next week or so so everybody can see this exact same presentation. Okay. Um, I think that answers the question, can they get a copy of the PowerPoint that's kind of the same same question? Yeah, it'll all be on the website. Uh, we have about three minutes left. You guys want to pick a few more questions to answer? Do, 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 do. There's so many. Um. <laughs> While you're reading, um, if I could just make mention, if you take um, one section at a time, uh, it's not as overwhelming as it may at first appear. And that's what we do in class at the ANA Summer Seminar. I can't tell you, uh, I keep on bringing it up because it, it's a it's a valuable source of information and it just helps you just immerse yourself in coin photography for a whole week and uh, being with other collectors and seeing the coins that they're photographing. And you have the opportunity of photographing different coins that you would never photograph uh, is uh, extremely valuable. Somebody asked what, what's the brand of that, uh, Flat, uh, ring light that you had, Clark, with the rheostat on it? Um, you know, it doesn't have a manufacturing <laughs> <laughs> label on it. Um, it's actually designed for a microscope. So um, it's a ring light for a microscope. Uh, they're out there. I, I bought it off of uh, Amazon, and uh, I believe it was around the $20 mark. Um, so very inexpensive. There are some that have... Um, um, diffused filters to put over the lights so you could diffuse the lights even more. So, Last question, I guess. Uh, somebody wants to know, is there a new problem when you're using axial lighting to make sure that the glass is perfectly clean, no dust, etc.? I would say it's not a problem, no. I mean, yes, you want it to be clean, but uh, I, it's, it's not an issue. And I would also uh, expand on that a little bit just to talk about the type of glass. In in class, we have used uh, beam splitter glass, which is very expensive. But um, we've also found that just a piece of glass out of a picture frame will, will work just as well. Um, and um, even go a little further, we've also discovered that uh, uh, teleprompter glass, although it works, it can give you some uh, ghost kind of colors in it so it's maybe not the best thing and also yeah. it's expensive yeah when you're doing um axial lighting um optical glass would probably be the best sometimes when you use uh, glass in frames it has a green tintage um look to it so you have to be careful about that um you could um edmund scientific has uh the uh beam splitter um glass 
uh, again, very expensive at times. It's, it's very unique. Sometimes you can get a five by seven piece for $70. And then other times it could be in the hundreds of dollars. It's, it's unique the way that um, um, they're on the marketplace there. But uh, usually a, a, if you're using the beam splitter glass, I would use a 70 to 30 transmission rate. Um, there are different, there's 50, 50, there's 70, 30, there's 60, 40. I typically use the 70, 30. So. And doesn't matter which way it's turned. It's it's still 70, 30, both directions. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. I guess that's about it. Is that right, Brianna? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, David and Clark, for your information on this wonderful presentation. I hope everybody learned something just like I did. Um, like I said earlier, we are recording this presentation, so we will put it on our website and within the next week or so. Um, thank you, everybody, for filling out the survey, and um, we will have more presentations coming up uh, one next week and then a few more of the, the rest of the year, and we'll have plenty more um, starting in 2021 as well, so hopefully we'll catch you there. Um, if we didn't get your question answered, I'm really sorry about that. David or Clark, would you be interested in um, sharing a way that they could contact you for follow-up questions? Sure. Yeah, that, that's fine. They could contact us. No problem. Okay. Do you have a best way to contact an email or something? Um, you could contact me at uh, my email, clarkfog1 at gmail.com. And mine would be dheinrichg at gmail.com. Awesome. Well, thank you again, both of you. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. And have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for coming. <laughs>